Radio Migrante every Sunday night from 9 to 10 p.m. on CHRY 105.5 FM. At magandang gabi po sa lahat ng nakikinig dito lamang sa Radio Migrante sa CHRY 105.5 FM, your leading source for diversity. Maaari nyo rin kami pakinggan sa www.rdo.to forward slash CHRY, Bell 5973, Rogers Digital Cable 945, o sa tunein.com kung may mga smartphones kayo. So ang inyong mga tagapaglingkod ngayong gabi ay si Rhea Gamana and Ish Cabana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only two of us, so we have so many spaces tonight. Uh, we we have an exciting topic tonight about mm -hmm. uh, migration, and this is a part of a talk here at York University that was held a few weeks ago. We had Dr. Robin Rodriguez, who's a renowned uh, author on migration, Filipino migration uh, to be exact. Uh, so just tune in and share if you haven't shared to your friends and to your families. And speaking of that, uh, shout outs to all the Filipinos in Ward 9, Filipino community here, uh, specifically with Teriel. Hello, Teriel. Thank you Magandang for tweeting gabi. us. <laughs> <laughs> At maraming, maraming, maraming salamat sa pakikinig lagi dito lamang sa Radio Migrante. So, gaya niya sinabi ni Ish, um, karoon na pagkakataon ng Radio Migrante upang uh, i-record yung, uh, yung talk na binigay ni Dr. Robin Magalit Rodriguez. So, siguro a little bit of background of what her book does titled, Migrants for Export, How the Philippine State Brokers Labor to the World. So, nilabas ito noong 2010. And her book investigates how and why the Philippine government transformed itself into what she calls a labor brokerage state, which actively prepares, mobilizes, and regulates its citizens for migrant work abroad, drawing on ethnographic research of the Philippine government's migrant bureaucracy, interviews, and archival work. Rodriguez presents a new analysis of neoliberal globalization and its consequences for nation-state formation. So si Dr. Robin Rodriguez po ay isang uh, professor po sa University of California, Davis, sa San Francisco. Before we move on to the clip, let's uh, go sa news information. I guess ako mauna, no? Yes. So, yes. <laughs> So perfect. Arrest of Tiamson couple not good for peace talk. So this is according from and this article is from bulatlat.com. So church-based organizations express concern over the recent arrest of alleged top communist leaders Benito Tiamson and Wilma Austria, saying this would affect the peace talks between the government of the Philippines or GPH and the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. In a press conference held March 28, Catholic Bishop Dio Gracias Iniguez said the arrest of Tiamson in Austria, in quote, will put a damper again to the formal talks that restarted so optimistically in February 2011, end quote. Excuse me. Tiamson in Austria, together with five others, were arrested on March 22nd in Karkar, Cebu, by combined elements of the police and military. The two, according to the NDFP, or the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, are their consultants that are and are protected under the Joint Agreement on Safety and Immunity Guarantees, or JASIG. Inigas, speaking as a core member of the Philippine Ecumenical Peace, Peace Platform, or PEPP, the largest ecumenical for for peace in the country called on both sides to go back to the negotiating table and talk about the next steps that can be taken to forge a path to a just and lasting peace. According to Iniguez, end quote, the PEPP maintains that principled negotiations, not the surrender of one party to the other, is what makes for genuine and enduring peace, end quote. In a report, GPH panel chairman Alexander Padilla said they would go back to the the table only if the talks would be end quote, on ceasefire or reduction of violence, end quote. The Armed Forces of the Philippines, or AFP, meanwhile, was more explicit. AFP Chief General Emmanuel Bautista, in a report, urged communist rebels to lay down their arms. And for our second news, migrant women, peasant groups mourn the death of rights advocate Irene Fernandez. So who is Irene Fernandez? Irene Fernandez is a migrant's rights defender peasant advocate and women's rights activist who passed away on March 31st due to heart failure. She was 67 years old. Migrante International, an organization of overseas Filipino workers, described Hernandez as a, in quotes, warrior of migrants' rights, end quote. In 1996, she was charged by the Malaysian government with maliciously publishing false news for writing a report on the horrific 
conditions of migrant workers in Malaysia, including the flight of Filipino migrant workers in Sabah detention cells. Her 13-year trial was the longest in Malaysian history. She was convicted in 2003 but was released on bail. She appealed the decision to the High Court that eventually dropped the charges against her in 2008. Fernandez was the director and co-founder of Tenaganita, an organization that runs a shelter for women's rights who were victims of human trafficking and abuse. In a previous interview with New Internationalist, Fernandez said, in quotes, If people's lives are at risk, how could you, can you sit back and pretend you don't know? In quote. Fernandez was a vice chairperson of International Migrants Alliance, or IMA, a broad alliance of 118 migrant groups from 25 countries and was able to visit the Philippines several times. In March 2007, she served as one of the jurors of the Permanent People's Tr Tribunal, second session in the Philippines. The International Tribunal declared then-President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo and the United States government guilty of crimes against humanity. Then, in November 2012, recently, Fernandez served as an expert witness for the Inter International Migrant Tribunal, or IMT, on the Global Forum on Migration and Development. The tribunal declared 37 states guilty of violating migrants' rights. In quotes, uh, IMA coordinator and spokesperson Eman Villanueva said, For her service to the migrants and people, Dr. Fernandez shall always have a place in our hearts. For her commitments to social changes and determination to fight, she will always be an inspiration to the tide of activists struggling for a better world. For her complete trust and the power of the grassroots people, Dr. Fernandez shall always be remembered with the highest respect in our collective memories, unquote. So you're still listening to Radio Migrante, and we have for tonight, Migrants for Export, How the Philippine State Brokers Labor to the World. Oh, here you go. So this is going to be primarily about my book, 2010 book, Migrants for Export, How the Philippine State Brokers Labor to the World. So let's just begin here. It's always a good place to start. So... During a 2003 state visit to the United States to discuss the Philippines' role in the global war on terror. Now, for those of you who are very young um, uh, or uh, unfamiliar, so in the immediate wake of the bombing of the Twin uh, Towers in New York City in, uh, on September 11, 2001, then U.S. President George Bush declared a global war on terror. And one of the things that he did in this declaration was to also invite countries around the world to participate as members of the so-called Coalition of the Women. So it was during this time when President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo visited uh, the United States to actually discuss its role as a member of this coalition. In fact, it was the very first nation in Asia, the Philippines, to declare its membership in this coalition. While in the United States, President Arroyo addressed U.S. businessmen as well. And during her addresses with U.S. businessmen, she urged them to fill their employment needs, both in the U.S., but also beyond the U.S., with workers from the Philippines. And during this speech, and she was addressing the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, chambers of Commerce. There was a national meeting of the various chambers of commerce in the United States. She made this statement. Not only am I the head of state responsible for a nation of 80 million people, I am also the CEO of a global Philippine enterprise of 8 million Filipinos who live and work abroad and generate billions of dollars a year in revenue for our country. She then proceeded to the extol, to celebrate the merits of hiring Philippine labor. They're highly skilled, she said. Well-educated, English-speaking, productive, and efficient. She even promised those who had business interests in the war on terror, because of course, wars are always big business. She promised those with interests in the war on terror that workers from the Philippines could play a role in building, uh, rebuilding the land for the people of Iraq. And in fact, not long after this sort of speech, we, there were, there was in fact a deployment of Filipino workers to Iraq. So let's think, let's look at this so-called enterprise that Gloria Mahapagal Arroyo, at least at the time, and now President Aquino heads up. It is in fact a highly profitable one. 
By the end of 2013, the World Bank estimates and the estimated that the Philippine, Filipinos and Filipinas working overseas were making 26 billion U.S. dollars. So by the end of 2013, the World Bank estimate, uh, estimates put remittances from Filipinos at 26 billion U.S. dollars. So and even at the height of the global economic crisis in 2008, Philippine remittances were still growing. So there was never a waning or decrease in remittances. When compared actually with other export earnings, of course many of you know uh, the Philippines exports many, many things. One of the things that it exports is clothing. Many of you actually may have coats, bags, shoes amongst you produced, um, in, uh, manufactured in the Philippines. And of course, clothing and garments is and has always been a top export earner for the Philippines. But when compared when compared to articles of clothing or even electronics, remittances can actually be even greater than export earnings from other kinds of commodities. In other words, it can be more profitable to, for the state to export people than garments. And let's look at it in a global perspective. When compared to other labor exporting countries, the Philippines comes in third in the world in terms of remittance um, earnings. So you can see here, India generates $71 billion, China, $60 billion, the Philippines, 26 so number three. But it's really important to understand its, its sort of ranking when you look at, kind of you look at uh, population. So, it, you know, the world population, in terms of world population, the Chinese Indian have far greater you know, uh, numbers of people. And so that's partly what explains kind of their ranking in terms of written earnings. So this just kind of goes to show, again, yet kind of more um, evidence of the ways in which this is this profitable enterprise. In terms of work, the Philippines' global scale of migration, if the Philippines is amongst the world's top remittance earning countries, the global scale of Philippine migration is unmatched. Many of you, of course, are very familiar, very familiar with uh, Filipino migrants in the United States, in Canada. Uh, certainly through the live-in caregiver program. Of course, increasingly, I think Carolina's work is really does an excellent job in illustrating you know, this new uh, influx through in service work. But really, the global scale of Philippine migration is unmatched. Uh, Philippine migrant workers can be found in every country around the world. So um, newly deployed or rehired migrants went to work in nearly 200 countries and territories wow. around the world. That's 200 countries. I and mean, literally, if you were to put up a, uh, an atlas of the world on this wall and we were to throw darts at it, wherever they land, it's likely that you'll find a Filipino worker. Um, nearly 2 million Filipino uh, men and women left the Philippines in 2012. That's based on the most recent. I mean, I haven't actually been able to get the 2013 statistics from the POEA or the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration. But simply, what that means is, you know, 5,000 people leave the Philippines every day, and they're going all over the world. In terms of understanding kind of the uh, the top destinations for Filipinos, um, top 10 are Saudi Arabia, UAE, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, Hong Kong, Qatar, Kuwait, Taiwan, Malaysia, Italy, Bahrain. These are just these are the top 10 destinations of the 200. Um, you can see many are in Asia and the Middle East. However, Filipinos and Filipinas set out to work on a temporary basis to a wide variety of countries. And again, you know, one example, of course, is here through uh, programs like the LCP uh, for traditional immigration countries like the United States. Of course, I'm a product of that sort of immigration. Immigration to places like the United, K uh, the United Kingdom or Australia. But really, I think my point simply is people are going everywhere. They're going to a range of countries. Right? Uh, prim primarily as temporary short-term workers, but also as, as uh, immigrants. Um, just again, in terms of types, occupational types, Filipinos are uh, household service workers, nurses, service workers, waiters, bartenders, and related workers, caregivers, of course you know this, uh, wiremen, etc. I think again what I want to simply emphasize here is that these are generally uh, gender segregated, uh, low status, low wage, and I need to emphasize temporary forms of employment. And remember, they're going everywhere in the world, and in many of this, those destinations, migrants often enjoy very few rights.
So what explains this? What explains the scope and scale of Philippine migration? So as I detail in my book, Migrants for Export, on which this talk is based, <coughs> I attribute the globalization of labor, of Philippine labor, to what I call the labor brokerage state. In other words, for many of you who do the work organizing uh, migrant workers, we know this as the Labor um, Export Policy, or LEP. But it's more than a policy for me, and this is, I think, where I kind of build from that analysis and move it forward, because it's more than simply a policy to encourage people to go out, and you'll see that today. And one of the things that I do, I think, in this book, and this sort of is different from most approaches or many approaches to understanding migration, is oftentimes migration scholars are looking at um, migration and the process of migration after people have already left, mm -hmm. right? They're looking at what is the experience of migrants when they get to a destination. What are immigration policies in a particular destination? And what I've done here is to really pay attention to what's happening happening in the country of emigration. Yeah. What I'm saying is that if we, yeah. even if we were to do, you know, and I say this in you, to U.S. audiences, um, and it's also true here in Canada, no matter how much you might be able to, you know, reform Canadian Maybe. immigration law, Maybe. we may reform fundamentally U.S. immigration law. It doesn't change this dynamic, which is that people are, are forced to leave the Philippines on a daily basis. So both on, from the perspective, uh, from a scholarly perspective, in terms of how we understand migration, but I think equally true for organizers who are interested in advocating for migrants, we need this kind of global and transnational perspective to look at what's happening here, but ultimately looking about at what's happening over there. So basically, I make this argument about the Philippines. Um, labor brokerage is what I call a neoliberal strategy by the Philippine state. Now, I'll come to this point again and really elaborate by what I mean by neoliberal strategy. It's simply important that you know this is what the point is of this discussion. Huh? So just to give you an overview of what this discussion for today will look like. So I'll start with just why. Why does the Philippine, uh, Philippines broker labor? Uh, again, you know, the initial answer that I already gave you, and we'll explain more, is that's a neoliberal, what I call a neoliberal mode of government talent. Again, I'll explain it, just to give you what, uh, you know, what to anticipate. The next major question I'll answer is how? How does it happen? And of course, it's something really interesting, right? The Philippines is an archipelago in the middle of the Pacific. How do 5,000 people every day leave, to go everywhere. I mean, everywhere. So I'll look at the process by which that happens. I'll look at, is this something that's just the Philippines? I think this is where it becomes important because then it starts to tell us not just about, is this a story that's about the Philippines only? Or is this something that's telling us uh, something about the world and things that are shifting? And then finally, I will talk, I hope, a little bit about some of the local impacts. And perhaps here, it won't be me because I don't know that I'm the expert of the local impacts. Maybe we'll have invite members of Migrante to share their experiences as workers here. Perhaps even you know, other people around the table um, who have done some really good research in this area to share. I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, so that we can open it up. OK, big first question. Why? Why does it do this? So in terms of just the beginnings of labor export, um, it was first introduced in 1974. And as you can see, President Ferdinand Marcos uh, was the one who introduced uh, what uh, we know as the labor export policy. So again, why? Really two major reasons for this. Uh, number one is as a major source of foreign currency for the Philippines. Number two, it was also to absorb on and under employment and it was hoped political unrest, because of course if you are familiar with uh, the history of, of you know, under the Marcos regime, uh, Filipinos were mobilizing even well before he came to power, he, he declared martial law. Now why was the Philippines in debt? And why was the Philippines, um, why were Filipinos unemployed? Why were they un underemployed? 
Well, in the late 1960s and early 70s, in the Philippines, like so many other third world, formerly colonized countries, they shifted in development strategies from what we know uh, from a kind of import substitution industrialization to export oriented industrialization, right? And so basically it's about the orientation, right? In terms of, you know, um, how we see how the Philippines was orienting itself in terms of development. Now, uh, this shift up to export-oriented industrialization left the Philippines struggling with um, balance of payment requirements. In other words, it's what left the Philippines in debt. And this shift didn't necessarily result in, in widespread employment. In fact, not only did it leave the Philippines in debt, it also left the Philippines on and underemployed. However, you know, the, you know, economists at the time who kind of propagated this perspective said, look, you know, this is just the growing pains, this is what happens, but eventually things will change. And in fact, you know, there was a real uh, uh, support for the Philippines, for, the, for Marcos and other dictators, right? The idea was uh, dictatorships were a good thing for third world countries because they would impose the kind of discipline that they, that they needed to, so, to develop. So this was all kind of, you know, an acceptable kind of uh, Orientation. So by 1972, Marcos declared uh, martial law. Um, two short years later, this law was, was introduced. So let's fast forward. Today, we are no, the Philippines is no longer governed by a dictator. But, so though it's sort of politically democratic, but in terms of its orientation, kind of economically, in terms of its developmental orientation, it continues to be dominated by these uh, logics. Uh, what we now think of as neoliberal uh, reforms. Now, neoliberal reforms have continued um, very aggressively since the fall of the Marcos regime. And neoliberal reforms have continued to saddle the Philippines with tremendous debt and therefore continued need for foreign exchange. And just in terms of like debt service or how much of the Philippine national debt budget actually goes to debt servicing, Nearly 20% of the national budget goes to debt, debt service. Neoliberal reform also results in increasingly precarious forms of employment. This is very important. You know, like, well, first of all, let's talk about what is neoliberalism. Neoliberal reform relates, uh, you know, re can result in uh, privatization. And I think you said deregulation as well, right? And, and one of the major things that it also can mean is this deregulation of labor markets. And, and really kind of you know, change in employment relations. And uh, in the Philippines, it has meant contractualization of work. So neoliberal reform, and again, the whole idea is, look, you do this, countries in the global south, these are prescriptions that come from major you know, world powers. You do this, you make it friendly for business. Businesses want to go to places where there's sort of flexible labor market, flexible labor, right? For those, if somebody does research on mining, I mean, you know about the kinds of incentivizing, right, investors and foreign investment. But what it results in, of course, for Filipinos is um, precarious forms of employment. You know, in the Philippines right now, last year, even though the Philippines, uh, you know, the growth rate was at 7%, unemployment in the Philippines was 7%, and underemployment was at 20%. Just go. So it's interesting because even migration um, migration officials ah. even recognize this. They say, look, economic growth alone does not equal jobs. Globalization does not always result in the same kinds of jobs because of contractualization and flexibility. So even migration officials recognize this is what's going on. This is why we need to export workers. So, you know, again, why, why is it that the Philippines workers labor? Well, look, you know, we all know, uh, for those of you who are familiar, uh, you know, have a family member or yourself, you're a migrant. What do you use your remittances for? You send it for what? Nagpapadala tayo para sa mga anak natin, right? And what do we, I'm sorry, that we send money to our children for school because somebody is sick, because somebody needs food. We make money buying boxes with filled with corned beef and spam, clothes. So this is because Filipinos are doing this. This is where it goes back to my initial answer, if you remember. I said, labor brokerage is a neoliberal mode of governmentality. Meaning to say, 
Neoliberalism has produced all of this precariousness of work. People don't, you know, it, it causes all sorts of, you know, protest, social unrest. And on a basic level, people just need to survive. So the state decides we're going to continue to encourage people to leave. And then when people uh, go abroad, they're generating money, and the money comes back to pay for all of these basic, basic things. Basic things that have become impossible for Filipinos to be able to secure for themselves because the same government has also deregulated, right? A whole host of industries, right? Oil is, I mean, we know about oil price hikes. Withdrawn any kind of investments in the public education, which is why Filipinos have to spend so much money to send their children to school. Withdrawn any kind of support for for, host, for sort of basic health care. People have to pay to be able to get some basic kind of uh, forms of um, support. In other words, remittances are to pay for the basic services um, that no longer exist as a consequence of neoliberal reform. So. For me, and this is what I mean when it says it's a neoliberal mode of governmentality. Right? It's how a government manages the social consequences of neoliberal economic reform. Right? So one of the things that I say is, you know, ne uh, there's something about labor brokerage that's very quintessentially or classically neoliberal, meaning to say, you know, the state has withdrawn completely. The only thing that it does do is ship people out. And people, the citizens of the Philippines, have to do the work of actually sustaining themselves. And there's something very kind of quintessentially um, neoliberal to that. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is especially kind of, um, and this is where it's not just an economic policy, it's a political one. This is not just to generate remittances. It's partly that. But partly, too, the, a labor brokerage state, and this is another point of calling it this neoliberal mode of governmentality. It needs to convince Filipinos that this is normal. There is a whole mechanism by which the Philippine state tries to normalize the out-migration of Filipinos. There are whole mechanisms by which it becomes normal for a young Filipino to imagine not what they're going to be when they grow up, but where they're going to be when they grow up. And I think for many of us, you know, Filipinos, we, it's become so commonplace and normal for us to know, aalis tayo, mag-aabroad tayo, diba? E bakit? And so the question is why? What, what is the mechanism by which it becomes so normalized, right? And how does, and so this is where I'll start to talk about this idea of, you know, Babum Bayani, the idea of the Philippine, the Philippine government has really invested in this idea of Filipinos as the new national heroes, how that's shaped how people think about themselves, um, how it helps to kind of contribute to this uh, out migration of Filipinos. So then I'm gonna, now let me just move over and go to the um, how, how does it do it? Okay, so let's look at how it does it, if we can just uh, move on. Uh, so basically two different things that the Philippines does to kind of um, actually send people abroad. One is what's called, uh, I say it's a transnational institutional apparatus. It's literally like this export processing zone. Maybe some of you know export processing zones are factories, right, in special areas. Well, literally, the Philippines has what is almost like a bureaucrat, like an assembly line to send people out. But the other piece of um, how people, the Philippine government sends people out is what's discursive, meaning ideas that it generates about how Filipinos are to think about themselves. And this is uh, what I call migrant citizenship. Okay, so just the institutions of labor brokerage. There's a lot, you should see. The Philippines has multiple uh, um, agencies across the world doing the work of brokering labor. Uh, the primary one is the Philippine Overseas Employment Administration, or the POEA. There's also the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, TESDA. Then there's the International Labor Affairs Service, or ILAPS, and it works, it comes under the Department of Labor and Employment. Even the Department of Foreign Affairs, including 
consular offices and embassies do the work as part of this, you know, this transnational apparatus of, of labor brokerage. Just historically, because I think it's important to understand, there uh, is a historical precursor or beginnings for LEP or labor brokerage. And it really comes um, in, uh, it's located in the history of the Philippines as a colonial, a source of colonial labor during the American colonial period. In other words, labor brokerage or LEP would not even exist as a very possibility for President Marcos if the Philippines had not already been supplying uh, the U.S. cheap laborers for several uh, decades you know, during the colonial period. So we can't understand the, the, the contemporary labor brokerage state without historicizing its roots in uh, U.S. Uh, colonialism in the Philippines. Um, there are so all of these, uh, this transnational apparatus has multi many different functions. One is authorization, and I'll explain that. Training, marketing, and bilateralism. Authorization is simply, simply put, just it has really expedited the process by which Filipinos can get from the Philippines to any place around the world. I mean, for any of you who are traveling on a non-Canadian passport, you know, if you had to come back you know, um, from being abroad uh, to come to Canada or just to come to Canada, you know how lengthy the process can be to just get to cross borders. But the Philippines has really made this process incredibly efficient. And it does, you know, and, and we could talk in more detail. And I talk about it, of course, in the book, all the mechanisms by which it makes it very half fast, but it makes it very fast. And that's crucial for this to work. Training, literally the Philippines has a vast array. It, it kind of regulates and um, encourages uh, training of Filipinos specifically for various labor markets. I mean, there are just a vast array. It's hard, it's not hard to find them. You go throughout Manila, there's always some test that certify, you know, training center on nearly every steep corner. There are specific ones just for the LCP, for those of you who don't realize. I mean, there really are specific programs where the Philippine government has studied the, the Canadian immigration system. The Philippine state knows this is what's required, A, B, C, D in Canada. So now we're gonna encourage these agencies to provide that education so Filipinos can come through to the LCP program, right? And so they go through this process. So again, this is labor brokerage at work. It's not just some Filipina in the Philippines decides, I'm going to go to the Canada. There's a whole met structure that helps to make that possible. This is also very, very important because I think a lot of people don't know, is the marketing of this. Literally, Filipinos have become commodified very much as just sort of products for global consumption. These are just a sampling of the kinds of marketing that gets done. You see these kinds of different brochures that the Philippine government actually produces to advertise Filipino nurses, Filipino seafarers. There's more. There's flyers for Filipino teachers, flyers for, you know, my book cover is just a sample. It's sort of basically based on a flyer produced, a brochure produced by the Philippine government. So um, it also actually goes on marketing missions. So literally it deploys people to go and meet with prospective employers where they really kind of market the value of hiring a Filipino worker. And look at the range of countries, a whole range of countries, Australia, Bulgaria, Canada, Japan, Jordan, uh, Korea, Kuwait, Lebanon, Qatar, Romania, Singapore, Taiwan, United Arab Emirates. There's really staff who go and they come, you know, to really kind of try to encourage prospective employers to hire. Perhaps what's even more important, though, is this. Is, and this is why the, the Philippine embassies and consular offices become important. Because ultimately, Filipino workers can be trained. Filipino workers can be advertised. But they can't leave if there isn't on some level some agreement on the part of the receiving country that they're going to accept Filipinos. And you know, the only, the only entity who has the capacity to do that is the government. Only the Philippine government has the capacity to informally or formally say to another government, we really encourage you to, to hire Filipinos and when you make your visa selections, you favor us. And it has done so, and it's done so very, very well. And so a whole range of informal and in 
you know, uh, formal kind of uh, agreements have been made, including to, to Canada, not just the Canadian national, federal government, national government, even provincial governments. Okay, so the next piece, and this is kind of where it, there's this other piece of it, it's the discourses, because this becomes important. How does the Philippine government shape how Filipinos start to think about migration? So the first probably discourse that we're very, very familiar with is this idea of balik bayan, which can be loosely translated as nation returnee. So there's a whole program that was actually associated with balik bayan. I mean, I actually don't, I, I have to trace the origins of the term, whether it always existed historically, but my sense, so I mean, I'm not, you know, I think somebody should do this, but what the etymology is of balik bayan. I don't think this is a term that existed before. Marcos introduced it in the 1970s as a formal program. Balik Bayan created a program where he encouraged people who were from abroad, who were living abroad, to come home, and he made it easy for people. That's why there's a Balik Bayan box. Uh, there was a state policy introduced to make it so that you can come home with a big box duty free. That was a government policy. Now Balik Bayan, we throw it around as a term to describe ourselves. That is where the state produces our own thinking about ourselves as connected to the homeland. Now, we may have different connections to the homeland, but it's become something that we use, many of us, to describe ourselves. This is a discursive practice on the part of the government, right? Babun Bayani, we know this one too, means new national hero. Again, you know, the state produces this discourse. We even have celebrations. You have mga, you mga Bagong Bayani Award. You have Bagong Bayani Award here in Canada, in Hong Kong, in the Philippines, right? This is, again, a discursive practice. And this discursive practice is aimed at making us think about our, ourselves in a particular way. And it does. I think a lot of people do feel like you know, mga, you know, sa, sa mga ibang mansa, right? We are the bang bayani of the Philippines, right? So again, it's a discursive practice, and we do get shaped by it, right? So now, one of the things is that it shapes how we think, and I think Migrante can attest to this. One of the things that resulted is because Filipinos believe themselves to be bang bayani, in 1995, there was massive mobilization uh, against the hanging of a Filipino domestic worker, Flor Contemplacion, in Singapore. So many, many Filipinos remember this, everybody's nodding, because this made global headlines. Flor Contemplacion was, was basically sentenced to execution, and uh, Filipinos were mobilizing the Philippines all around the world. In fact, Migrante was formed as a result of the mass transnational mobilizations of migrant workers. And a lot of what Filipinos said was, we are the Bagong Bayani. Because we're Bagong Bayani, the government owes us. It needs to investigate. It needs to stop the execution of Filipino migrant workers. Of course, it did it. Even though many, many Filipinos believe that she was, was completely set up, right? When, you know, if, you, if any of you look at the case, you know, lots of Filipinos were really <coughs> questioning whether she really was, you know, was, whether she was just the victim of a frame, you know, being framed, set up. Many people believe that. But the Philippine government was ultimately more concerned about preserving its diplomatic relations with Singapore and ultimately trade relations than with saving her life. But it knew it had to do something because Filipinos were outraged, outraged. I mean, the, the protests they say against floor contemplations hanging was even more than the, the mobilizations against the Marcos dictatorship. Even government officials told me it was a crisis. It was a huge crisis. So what the Philippine government did to kind of satisfy or placate or to calm the Filipino population was to introduce this thing called the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Act. And then it also tried to introduce these other acts, including like this Dual Citizenship Act. Now, it's in these laws, I start to argue in my book, that we see a, a yet another strategy that the government uses to try to, it's a, like a discursive strategy, to shape Filipinos' relationship to migration. And how does it do it? 
this is what I'll show you, which is next. So one of the things that happens, and this is what I found in my research, is that these laws, for many minor Filipinos, it's made many Filipinos feel as if they're protected when they're abroad. Because there's a long process to leave the Philippines. Well, it's not that long, it's quite fast. But part of the process of leaving the Philippines is your overseas, your certified overseas employment contract. Part of the law that we just talked about that was introduced after floors hanging, introduced what were supposed to be protections for migrant workers, right? Even, you know, the World Bank and the IMF and many organizations look to the Philippines and say it's a, a rights-based model, they say, because there's these laws on the books to protect Filipino workers. So what I found in my research is many Filipinos do believe, because they've gone through the process, that they have these protections. But what I found is when Filipino migrant workers demand those protections, there is a way that nationalism and citizenship, this idea of bambayani, becomes a form to discipline Filipino workers when they're abroad. So one of the five the cases that I found was a case of factory workers. And this is, you know, I mean, there are many, many other cases, but this is sort of like a, a very clear instance where you see brokerage of the Philippine state in another way, right? It brokers labor, but it brokers labor also in that it's willing to sacrifice workers' rights in favor of other kinds of interests. So what happened was in Brunei, in the, in the Brunei, Brunei has all of these garment factories. 80% of the garment workers in Brunei's garment factories are actually Filipino. So basically the Filipinos were really, really angry because they felt that their employment contracts were not being met. They left the Philippines with a contract, and in the contract it said how much they're supposed to earn. But they felt like the employers aren't paying them what is on the contract. So they went to the Philippine embassy because they believe the embassy is supposed to enforce the contract. After all, the contract is signed by the Philippine government. They went to the embassy. They asked for the embassy to represent their interests. And then they said, you know, it's good for the embassy to come, I say, because they can speak English very well. They felt that the embassy officials will best represent their interests in front of the employers. Eventually, what happened was the workers trusted the government officials. Eventually, the workers were no longer at the table. Eventually, the Philippine government, because they trusted the government, represents them because of these laws, because the contract is signed by the government, trusted the Philippine officials to, to negotiate for them. But what the government did instead was to negotiate on terms favorable to the employer. They promised the employer, we'll get rid of the troublemakers. We'll put them on a blacklist. If you, you know, promise the employer, just give them a little bit of money, but you don't have to give what they fully demand that's here. Then they even sent the vice president at the time to the, of the Philippines, the vice president to go to Brunei to say, go back to work. Nakakahiya naman kayo, right? You're ashamed. You're, you have to live up to, you know, our image as Filipinos. Go back to work. Just a month after the vice president went, President Arroyo, actually her first state visit after the fall of the Estrada regime was to go to Brunei to address the workers. So in other words, right, this nationalism, this citizenship that the Philippine government has done, it became a, a way of trying to discipline workers, right? So anyhow, I mean, just to, to kind of wrap up. So is this something that's globalizing? And my fear is, it is. So one of the examples of this is the Global Forum on Migration and Development. This is where I met some of you, uh, the migrant organizers more recently in a mobilization uh, in New York City um, around the, the hot UN high-level dialogue on migration and development. So basically, there's a global conversation amongst global policymakers saying that have basically encouraged the expansion of temporary labor migration programs. And the Philippines, the Philippines is being celebrated as the model that developing countries should aspire to. The model, why? They say the Philippines is a rights-based temporary labor migration program. So as you can see from the example that we had earlier, is this really a rights-based approach? Now this is sort of one clear example, but I think you know, there are numerous examples. 
You could probably speak it, about it here, you know, um, people who are working with migrant workers here in Canada, to what extent you can rely on the Philippine um, Embassy to truly represent migrant workers' rights. Uh, we know in, throughout the Migrante Network, this idea of contract substitution is a big issue, meaning Filipinos go out of the country with this certified contract by the Philippine government, they believe in the contract, and the contract, when they get to their country of destination, does not even matter. Now, some people just accept it. Fortunately, there are organizations like Migrante, and they have been successful to assert that the Philippine government owes the migrant worker to ensure that those, those contractual obligations are met. And the most, the, 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 the successful cases when, you know, in terms of really enforcing these kinds of contracts have typically been when there are really strong organizations. In the case of the, the, this strike, the organizing was rather weak. I think under different circumstances, they may have actually been able to win in this struggle. For those of us who care about migrant workers' rights, Filipino or not, I think my worry is labor brokerage and the Philippine model is being propagated. And for those of us who care about migrant workers' rights more broadly, we need to be paying attention to, to, to this uh, phenomenon. And yes, that was the talk of Dr. Robin Rodriguez, a professor from University of California, Davis, where she talked uh, here at York University about migrants for export, how the Philippine state brokers labor to the world. And this is uh, the same title of her book that's available online. So uh, for tonight, we talked about um, the, the role of the government in exporting people and how it profits from their Actually, we have a question, but we're not able to to accommodate that. But uh, one question from Facebook says, what would be the future effects of House Bill 3576 to Filipino migration if it will be implemented? And it tells true of the tale of how the government continues to profit until today. Because the HB 3576, if you don't know, is a proposed uh, law to enforce uh, forced remittance for for us Filipinos abroad to pay back uh, our remittance that will be implemented by the government. So that was the talk of Dr. Robin Rodriguez again and I uh, hope you learned a lot uh, tonight. And for our shout outs for tonight, uh, thank you for listening Teresa Fiel and our correspondent Ate Mary. Maraming maraming salamat uh, Ate Mary for mm-hmm. uh, your your big contribution dito mm-hmm. sa Radio Migrante. So our announcements for tonight, meron mo tayong isa yeah. na ano no recorded siya yeah. from Migrante. But that will be later. I'll I'll talk about the Good Friday first. Oh, yes, uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, the, we have uh, an activity on Good Friday, April 18th. And it starts at 2 p.m. at the Church of Holy Trinity. That's behind Eaton Center here in Toronto. And the title of that activity is called Walk for Justice, Stations of the Cross. So there will be some presentations in different uh, or various parts of Toronto featuring uh, the, the experiences of migrants here in Canada. So that is sponsored by a coalition of local churches and ecumenical organizations in Toronto. So go there. It starts at 2 p.m. at the Church of the Holy Trinity behind Eaton Center, and the final station is there again by 4.30 p.m. There will be soup and bread offered as well, and it is suggested that you bring your own mug for soup. Okay, salamat. At uh, gaya ho na binanggit ko kanina, ay, uh, meron tayong isang clip na mula po sa Migrante Alberta. Ito po ay uh, ukol sa Consular Services Campaign na patuloy pa rin pong ginagawa ng Migrante Alberta. Alberta is home for over 100,000 Filipinos. The Philippine community continues to grow through the Canadian government's Temporary Foreign Workers Program. Despite the sheer number of Filipinos in the province, services from the Philippine consulates are poor and inadequate. We need a permanent consular office in Alberta to serve our growing community. Join our campaign to have a consular office in Alberta. For more information, email us at migrantialberta at gmail.com or find us on Facebook at Alberta Consul. 
Okay, at uh, maraming maraming salamat po muli sa pakikinig dito lamang sa Radio Migrante sa CHRY 105.5 FM, your leading source for diversity. Up next, I see Roy Green and Lady Soul of Odyssey. So, may mga pahabol ka Or you good? Okay, so um, hanggang sa muli po. Uh, again, maraming maraming salamat at uh, hanggang sa muli at magandang gabi.